Welcome to the Create Today podcast. And this show is all about how you can create the life that you want, no matter what shit you've been through. And my guest today, I'm your host, Karen Stanley. I always forget to say that part. Um, my host, um, my guest today is Bridget Talty. And I've been um, honored to get to know her through her nonprofit. It's called A New Leaf. It's here in Mesa, Arizona. And it's really honored in my life and created so much joy in my life to be able to meet her. And, and she's inspired me to serve more and do more for the community, which has really, really added so much joy to my life. And she's such a beautiful person. And I want to hear about, um, have her tell us all about that and about her life, because she has a very unique um, you know, upbringing and story that's beautiful. And I don't know very many details about it. So we're going to get jump right in. Bridget, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your time and, and your beautiful soul and your beautiful spirit today. Thank you, Karen. Mm. So I want to hear about your, um, your story um, growing up and then your own children. You have three adopted children? Yep. Three oh. adopted kiddos from Guatemala. Uh, all three of them are Guatemala? Uh -huh. And how old are they now? Um, I have a 22-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 17-year-old. Wow. How old were they when they when you adopted them? They were all under a year. So Dylan was seven months old, Marcus was five months old, and Mia was two months old. That's so special. And you yourself were adopted, right? I was. I was um, born in Detroit, Michigan, and... Um, into the Catholic diocese and I lived with the nuns till I made it through my first round of vaccinations at six months and then adopted by my parents. Mm. You lived in Detroit? Uh huh. For all of it? Did you graduate from high school in Detroit too? You no, I um I was born in Detroit. We lived there till I was three and then I grew up in a real small town um, in Northern California below Lake Tahoe called Coloma. Mm. So it was a gold mining town, um, beautiful and um, just a neat place to grow up, but very, very small. My high school graduating class only had 41 people in it, so. Wow. Yeah. Very small town. And is it the gold mine that brought your family there? Is that the reason why you moved there? No, nope. just happened to be that um, my dad worked in um, the Bay Area and it was a small town within driving distance. He would go work for the week and then come back up to um, near Lake Tahoe for the weekends. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, did you have other siblings that were adopted or any, did they have any naturally born children? I have a brother and he is the only natural, mm -hmm. um, child in our family. And there was 23, um, adopted cousins, everybody else. It was kind of, it must've been the thing to do in the Catholic church at that time. So all of my cousins and I were adopted and my brother's the only natural child. Wow. And you only have the one brother? Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Is he older or younger? He's older, six years older. Mm. I love it. How did you get to Arizona? Um, I was in... <laughs> I don't know how deep you wanted to jump into it, Karen, but I, I grew up and my parents got divorced when I was six mm. and, um, literally the day after my parents got divorced, my dad asked for the divorce. And once my parents got divorced, literally my mom went downhill, became an alcoholic, mm. um, a lot my dad moved away to the city and back then it was never um an option for children to go with the father you always went with the matriarch with the mom mm -hmm. so we just were with my mom and um it it became dark and it became bad and 
um, she had boyfriends coming in and um, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol. And so she and I didn't get along. I didn't like the people in and out of our house. And I guess when I, it was like my first week I, of being in high school and I was young, I was like 12, just approaching 13. And um, I got in a fight with her boyfriend and she called me at school and said, don't come home. And so I didn't. And I called her back later and she said, come get your items, everything from your room. And if you promise me you'll never come home again, never show your face to me, I will give you, there's a vehicle called a Vega. It's really the worst car in the world. Ugly and <laughs> it was awful. She had a Vega and she said, if you promise to never get in contact with me again, I'll give you the Vega. So I took the Vega and never went home again, never saw her again. Um, so it's weird now as an adult, then I didn't think much of it because you just survive, mm -hmm. you just keep going on. But as an adult, I think back, I think, holy cow, I was homeless at 12 or 13 and I didn't even know it really what was going on. Where did you go? Um, well, I was at school and I was on the payphone talking to her and my friend Jennifer saw me and she said, what's going on? And I told her, she said, well, come spend the night at my house. And I did. And her parents owned a big grape vineyard and a um, cherry farm. We had cherry trees. So I moved in with them and I just never left till I graduated from high school. They kept me the entire time and I became part of their family. That's um, so sweet and amazing. Yeah. Where did and your brother go? My brother was, our, he's six years older, so he was already off to college. Okay. Um, so you'll, every now and then you'll hear my husband, Mike, say, you're worth way more than a Vega. You should have held out. You're worth way more than a Vega. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like an ongoing joke with us. Aww. But so when I graduated from high school, I went to Santa Barbara and started college there and fell in love with the, the land, the ocean, the school. And I knew I needed to get out. It was very expensive and mm -hmm. You can't really be a social worker in Santa Barbara and live any kind of lifestyle. So, so I, expensive. yeah, I just looked up good um, social work colleges and um, Arizona was one of them. And so I came here. Oh, I didn't know that. And you had, did you meet Mike here? Yeah, had... I met him the first day. My husband, Mike, I met him the first day I moved here. No and way. We kind of went on, I, I don't know if you call them dates in college because we were so broke, we couldn't do anything, but we started um, hanging out and never have been apart since. That's so beautiful since you were yeah. 19 years old, 18 years old. Never broken up, um, nothing. It was just a lucky match. Oh. I don't think it's necessarily luck. I think you need, we need to do a whole podcast on how to keep your amazing relationship alive for this long. It's a beautiful thing. I yeah. love Mike. He's such a sweetheart. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's such a sweetheart. Um, so you knew from, how old were you and you knew you wanted to do social work? I don't, honestly, Karen, I don't remember hmm. ever wanting to do anything else. Like wow. I I don't remember being, oh, I want to be a teacher or a nurse. I thought um, something in my soul knew I needed to help others to keep my own life safe. Um, I had grown up in such a weird way that I thought I got to work in a, an environment that heals me and keeps me you know, and I think part of it's not pitting 
my own situation because there's always somebody worse than us. So um, it was more like a survival technique. And, and I really, I was always the one that helped the lost dog or, you know, walk somebody home. So I don't, I don't ever remember having dreams of doing anything else. You just knew you wanted to help people. You love people. Yeah. And I, I just do love it. Like I love it to the point where I couldn't even retire. Like yeah. I was going to retire last year and I couldn't, I just, mm -hmm. um, it's an addiction to be part of a better thing than, you know, material items or anything else. It's just, um, you know, you know how you feel when you're serving it just feels good i agree and unless you're what you've taught me is not only inspired me to serve more and do more um but also when you're really there boots on the ground talking to you know the people who need the most help um the homeless and the men mentally ill which usually go hand in hand um Gosh, it really gives you perspective in your life and it gives you so much joy and you know, you need to do more. You, we have been, it, it tells me we are so blessed. Mm -hmm. I am so lucky how I must give more. I must do more. It is my duty. It, and that's what it really um, taught me. You taught me that, you know, if we just working with you just for the last couple of years and I just love how, how did you get to, um, how did you even know about a new leaf? Did you have other jobs before this one? You've been there for how long? Um, I've been at a new leaf for 33 years. I was graduating and I thought, you know what, I need to get some real life experience. And I, a friend of mine worked for a new leaf and I thought I'm going to do a year there. Why not? You can't make money in this kind of um, social work nonprofit, but I could get a lot of good experience. And so I promised myself that I'd do a year and then I would move back to California. And here I am. I just, um, I, you know, and we've been able to make sense of it. Mike's uh, was on the fire department he could work overtime and I like being local. I like um, contributing locally to my community and it's just worked out. It's been okay. It's been a lucky mm -hmm. thing to be able to do something you love for so many years and, and not have to worry. It's beautiful. I, I couldn't believe when you shared the um, the story about the domestic violence. So you have a lot of different uh, kind of sections of a new leaf, um, right? So why don't you tell us about all of them and then tell us about the domestic violence um, shelter and the helpline that you told me about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we, um, a new leaf, oh, we started 52 years ago. Um Two beautiful people from Mesa Public Schools, Larry Simmons and Dorothy Mitchell. And they saw a lot of kids that were struggling in school on drugs, lack of family support. So they started a little after school kind of tutoring program. And it just grew and the city would come to us, the government. And so then we needed a shelter then. So it's like it piggybacks off. Um, we call them wraparound services. So if Karen came to a new leaf and she was in the domestic violence shelter, we also have a workforce program. So not only can we keep you safe, but we can get you some job skills and teach you how to write a resume. And so it, it you don't just get a one-stop help here. We want to get you back on your feet. Mm -hmm. And in a positive way, we don't ever want to see you again. We want to get you to the point where 
you are you and you don't have to count on somebody mm -hmm. to um help you in that way it just feels better to get a paycheck and to be taking care of yourself and we know that and we want people to succeed and do that um so we have domestic violence shelters homeless shelters workforce programs we have a beautiful foster care program that has mm -hmm. over 100 kids in foster care mm -hmm. uh, we have outpatient counseling for mental health, and that's booming right now um, with all the COVID things that happened in the last couple of years. We've seen an increase in a lot of the mental health situations. Indeed. Um, so we just do so much. And one thing a new leaf is not good at is saying no. So our growth plan is always to not grow this year and kind of get stable, but then there's a need in the community and um, our CEO, Michael Hughes, has been here 45 years and a heart of gold. He just has a heart of gold and um, sometimes it's not always the best um, business decision, but he does what's right for the community and it's um that's part of what keeps me here personally is that i trust we're doing things for the right reasons and the community always comes to embrace us and support us and we'll we'll make it work we'll we'll figure it out and we'll make it work no, it's you ever get overwhelmed? Like you think that there's never enough beds, there's never enough phone calls, or never enough work or workers, or never enough food because the need is so great. Do you ever get overwhelmed? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's hard. Um, and it's kind of the pendulum swings. You'll see, you know, d domestic violence if you watch the news and homeless that's the big hot topics right now there's so many issues with that um so that's kind of on the minds now it's been children's mental health 10 15 years ago so it kind of swings so it keeps it interesting cuz you're always trying to improve a program um services in different areas so it's neat that way but you just keep working hard it, it gives you i think i've learned to not be burdened by that and be energized and you know how i am i'll call you and karen we don't have anybody to serve a meal at evmc can you help Mm -hmm. And I, I just learned over the years, because I'm not good at asking. I'm not a beggar. I'm not an asker that way. But I got to know I'm doing it for someone else. I'm doing it for the people. And truly, my heart believes I don't come to Karen and ask her for something that wouldn't interest you. I come, I try to give people opportunities in areas that I know they're passionate about, that they love. Um, so I know some people are into veteran services. Some people only want to give to domestic violence because they have a background in that. So I just try to focus on where individuals can be helpful. And I just ask, you can't get help without asking. And, and a new leaf can't do it alone. Um, normally, what we get in funding is pays for about 60% of what it costs to run our programs. Mm. So we have to go to our community. And um, I just try, my job is to make it a pleasure for us to receive and for the donor to give. You're so good at it and you're so passionate about helping that you truly are an inspiration. Um, tell me about the domestic violence. I, I was blown away when you told me this. Um, you had a call center, you, ha you have a shelter 
And so in 12 years ago, 13 years ago, tell the tell my audience what happened. Yeah, we um there are shelters across the valley. And what it was is if you were a victim, you would call this shelter. And I would say the beds are full or you call. So you had to make several calls before you could find an open bed. Well, often all the beds are full. Um, so a woman had called in and needed a shelter bed and we didn't have one. We said, call back tomorrow morning. And um, she was murdered that night. So Michael Hughes, the CEO, I mean, the whole community was at loss. What do you do? This woman asked for help. And we couldn't give it to her that night. Um, no shelter in the valley could, and she lost her life. So um, a, we started with help of others, a hotline. And if now if somebody calls and they all the beds are full at the shelters, they'll put them in a hotel. So there's safety for that night and it just goes till there's a bed opening. So it's an expensive program, um, but it's another one of those, we'll make it work. We have to make it work. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't bear that burden of knowing somebody didn't make it that night because you simply didn't have a bed available for them. I can hear that it still breaks your heart 13 years later or 12 years later or whatever it is. It breaks my heart. And I didn't know, but tell us how many um, people that you served last year and how many calls. We um, call, we serve a new leaf across the agency serves nearly 30,000 individuals a year. Mm. So it's really impactful. It's to whether you're a veteran, you're a newborn foster child, you're a homeless. Um, 30,000 is a lot um, to be serving year round. It's incredible. Um, and the Domestic Violence Center. Tell them how many phone calls you got last year. Gosh, we got close to. Doesn't uh, have to be exact. I remember it being, I think it was over 10,000, right? Yeah. Um, over 7,508 people escaped domestic violence. So that is quite a few. And then 10,187 phone calls were answered for victims um, actively in a domestic violence situation. So over 10,000 calls. That's 28 calls a day. Yeah. A woman fearing her life because of someone at home because of violence in her own home. Yeah. And they have somewhere to call and they have somewhere to go and they can escape. Is it? 24 hour hotline. So that's, in, you know, and just amazing because I think also I wanted to spread awareness because people don't, I don't know if most people realize how huge a problem this is and how many people are suffering and how there is, there is help. There is, there are resources and that you can't, they can call you and they can get out and they can save their lives and they can get a big place to sleep. Um, that number just truly blew me away. Yeah. Also, you know, I think sometimes we develop kind of a callous attitude um, against uh, or towards homeless. I, I feel myself kind of going back and forth. I'm not sure if I'm getting scammed. Um, I see so, so many people, you know, asking for help. I want to help, but I also want to be safe. I'm typically, I'm not going to stop, not going to not even get close to a strange man, you know, of yeah. any man that I don't know if I'm by myself, right. If I don't, if I'm not with my husband. So my safety is obviously everybody's safety is important, yeah. but I would love to hear your answer to, you know, I, if we, I'm not sure, you know, sometimes I would have McDonald's gift cards in my car. And so I'd at least give 
food because you don't know if you're going to give money, they're going to buy drugs or if they're even con artists, because we've heard of that too. We know, we don't, we don't know if this person is, is real or not. So the, the one thing is, I just love that if we are just giving or supporting you, we know that they're, the money is going to uh, someone and they're actually getting help, not yeah. hopefully not, you know, buying drugs or they're getting help for their drug addiction. Right. And which of course we want to do. Um, but what would you say about people that have, you know, they might see a homeless person and go, why don't they just get a job? I say, um, for me personally, I can't judge. I can't judge why that human is sitting in the peninsula near the freeway um, holding a sign. I don't know what war he's been in. I don't know the mental health status. I've never walked in that person's shoes and it doesn't matter. I choose not to hand out money out of my car. I don't think for even traffic safety, it's a smart idea. Um, I've seen too many accidents and stuff happen. I would rather Personally, I give to a new leaf or give to St. Vincent de Paul. I try to help that way where it's organized. That being said, there's been times I've seen women and children in front of McDonald's and I will buy them a meal. My heart breaks and I my rule of thumb goes out the window. But it's a it's a call you make. A gut feeling, I guess, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, I choose to give in a way that um, we have purchase power. So if if we get a hundred dollars, we can serve a lot of bellies mm -hmm. and feed a lot of people off a hundred dollars. When I see the family in front of McDonald's, I spend twenty bucks and I feed three or four people. Not a good value, mm. but it it's what I needed to do in that moment. And that happens to me a few times a year where I break my own rule and do it anyways. Um, but I think probably the wisest thing is to trust a nonprofit that you like and, and give that way. Um, that's a great perspective. I didn't know that as far as the buying power. So if we're giving a person $20 or if we're giving a new leaf $20, then that it actually goes further because of your resources. I didn't know that. Yeah. Cause we can make, um, we have connections with the different food banks where we can buy food by the pound. So we get a lot more, um, we just can do that in, in Costco and different companies. And um, we include the community. So, you know, you guys have served 110 um, men at East Valley Men's Center. And if you get strategic and you start working on it, and it's important to you, you can make that money go a long ways. Um, so true. You brought in some pretty darn fancy meals for those guys that they would never have um, had in quite a long time. But you're mindful and you do your homework and you you make it work. Well, I mean that sounds great, but we're just really busy and have time to cook. <laughs> <laughs> and you told me that what they don't usually get. So I'm like, yeah. well, why don't we just make it special? And like, it just was, it, it was actually what we had to do because we didn't have time to, we didn't make time to cook ourselves, but um, <clears throat> that was a really special, uh, we're looking forward to doing it again, many, many times um, for me. And just to be able to look in the eyes of somebody who you are serving and to have somebody I'll be in tears thanking you for some a, a fajita. You know, it's like we take so much for granted in our lives. Anybody who has a dinner tonight, food on the table and a roof over our heads. And um, we just take so much for granted. And yeah. 
I, I think that's what makes you personally so special and why I just love you so much is that you said, I'm not, I don't judge. I couldn't possibly judge anyone for any circumstances. And isn't that such a beautiful thing? I think that it's a really hard thing for us to do because we all these roles that we grew up with, or you're supposed to do this. And why don't you just work? And why don't you just go do, get a job? And and it's like, wait a second, how would you know? How do you know what that person has gone through? How do you know if he fought a war? That's why veterans are so close to our heart. Not because, not just because my husband's a veteran and my father's a veteran and the no amazing, wonderful people that fought for our country that I love so much. Um, it's because also they come back and they have been completely traumatized for life. Yeah. And there's very few services uh, God bless everybody at the VA and God bless everybody who's helping the veterans right now. It's just not enough. It's just, it's very tragic and there's so much suicide and how, how would me or you or anybody listening, unless you have fought in a war, how would you know what that's like? There's no way for you to know how, what is the mind like? What has that done to him or her? Um, you just don't know. And that's a really beautiful thing. That's such a gift that you've given me to how would, how could any of us judge? Why don't we just go help? What can we do to be part of the solution? Yeah. And you know, I see it, Karen, is you take a hundred people anywhere mm -hmm. and you're going to get, you know, more than half that really really want to help themselves do better you're going to get some superstars that do it quicker and then you're going to get a handful of you know people that are scamming the system and taking advantage and whatever I, yeah what do you do i can't waste my energy worrying about the few that are taking advantage of us when in 33 years, I've seen so many of our clients come back and serve a meal. So mm -hmm. many of our clients come with their $800 tax credit and say, I want to give back. I'm finally back on my feet. We've seen kids that were teenagers and have come back and said, I wouldn't even know how to hug if it wasn't for a new leaf. You if I do a lot of work for those people, then the job is well spent. I, I can't worry about the few that take advantage because you take a hundred car salesmen, a hundred principals, a hundred doctors, there's going to be idiots in that hundred too. There just is. So you're so right. That's such a beautiful perspective. Thank you. And you've seen, I've, I watched you serve the meals at EVMC and there's fellas that will come up and look you straight in the eye and thank you. And I know my heart knows that those people feel the love of a warm meal and feel the love of humans that are coming to serve it. You mm -hmm. know, um, there's something somebody still cares about them and i think that's what they get and some of them are going to just think you're a bunch of rich people that bought them a meal to make yourselves feel better and that's okay you do it for the ones that appreciate it and you change their life you know you don't ever know if you're going to be that person that sparked a change so you just do it with the kind heart and move on yeah it's so true. I love hearing the stories. You help so many people. Um, what tell us some stories of some success and some people that you've helped or things that they've accomplished or the things that they've been able to do after getting um, you know, the services that they need for however long they need them from. Just anything that comes to your mind in the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, La Mesita. Um, the family homeless shelter is a good example because we had people that were here um, when we rebuilt the property and they came, they were the first group that moved in and they can stay here at the, 
at the affordable housing part as long as they want, as long as they're good renters. They have a very low, um, their rent is much less than it would be, you know, at another apartment complex, but they get child care, they get um, workforce, resume writing, and there is women that have been here with their four or five, six children and lived here for years and then finally will move on and come back and be like the love that I felt, the support, the people teaching me that, you know, I was worthy and I could do this. That's a big deal. And those are the people that give back time after time after time. Um, we had one mom at the shelter right here, and it's nice that our office is at the shelter because I, I get energized by seeing the kids and the families, but she didn't have a job, and she said, well, I'll never get a job. I never even graduated from high school, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You have all these kids they always look perfect. Their hair is done. They walk to the bus. You take them. Um, she goes to every school meeting. I'm like, you have mad skills. You could be working as a receptionist. You could be at a hotel. Anything with your organization. Your, I mean, but she just needed somebody to boost her and tell her that she saw skill as you know a college degree and and that's not it it's about being able to organize yourself enough to be productive and she came back and had a job and was doing great so I love that yeah um everybody can can do a neat work it is. That's beautiful. Um, I really want to share about the the kids, most especially recently, that are being rescued from sex trafficking. I'm not sure if everybody knows the the extent and the amount of suffering that is happening right now, um, and how massive sex trafficking is. Maybe they do. I don't know who who really has that awareness. But could you tell us what's happening in the last you know year or two from your experience and the kids that you are being rescued? I you know there it changes so frequently um, with all the border issues and um, so a lot of the programs in Arizona that help children that have come across the border, um, you'll see a high increase and then a low dump. And it just depends how the border is working. But I think it's hard because there's such a negative outlook on those kids or on, on any, you know, buddy from another country that's not here um, with all the legal documents. But in my in my mind personally, they're children. Um, you just have to help kids and trying to make it safe and and find a better way for those kids is important. Mm -hmm. um, but there is definitely a negative connotation to that with a lot of the community. Um, no, I just mean, I don't think that people know that there are so many being you know, trafficked over the yeah. coming across the border. People might not realize that, um, but also I want you to share how what you guys are doing. I know you need a new van because you have so many more boys that are being rescued and you're res they're being rescued out away from the sex traffickers, which is a mi miracle, right? Yeah. Then what happens? Um, so kids that come across the border that um, are undocumented and don't have families, the government here will take care of them 
until they find a permanent home, whether it be foster care or family in the, in the United States, or if they take them back to their home country and find family there. Um, so there's a desperate need for that support for those kids, for sure. Um, it, it's hard work. It's really, really hard work. Yeah. And um, do you, you have more housing? Did you have to add additional housing or what, how are you helping them? Um, they, different programs in the Valley take care of those kids and there's different age groups. Obviously they have kids that come across the border that are, are real young and then they go all the way up until 18 of the kids taken care of. But um, it's a hard for nonprofits to run those programs because the numbers change all the time and you have to be prepared to get an influx of kids but you don't always have all those kids. You know, it just depends what, mm -hmm. what's going on at the border. And that changes from watching the news daily, it seems. Right. Well, at least, I mean, as much as it hurts my heart to hear about it, um, at least some are being saved. Mm -hmm. And you're helping them be rehabilitated and you're helping them get clothes. And <clears throat> when I saw... Even when we were doing the little, you know, the little trick or treat event, um, it was hard for me to just give them a stupid piece of candy and a glow stick or whatever. I don't know, glow glass, whatever I brought, can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, they were so grateful, and I just, it just kills me. Um, and I tried to keep my smile on because I just wanted to cry. And um, it was so beautiful. These beautiful little kids, just cutest little boys. And they're just so excited about a freaking I don't know, glow necklace or something, whatever. Yeah. So sweet. And it also made me realize that just the littlest things that you think are dumb, make a huge difference in somebody else's yeah. life, you know? So yeah. it doesn't, even if you don't have a lot of money, um, $5 goes a long way. Or even if you don't have any money, you could have, you have time. Like yeah. you, could go, we, you could go help, right? You, yeah. you have tons of volunteers. How many volunteers do you, you have in, in any given time? Oh, well, we have individual volunteers. We have group volunteers um, and we have donors. So we have like right now, I think we have close to serving EVMC meals and then the shelter in Glendale, one of our domestic violence, it takes teams and teams of people to, to serve and prepare and do the meals. So I would say we have upwards of a thousand volunteers um, coming intermittently. And then we have our regulars that come you know, Karen could sign up and help in the workforce program, helping women write resumes and come every Monday from noon to five or, you know, people that come weekly and um, we count on them every week. They help as couriers. They help with um, running the program phones, administrative needs, um, helping in the kitchen. So, a lot of different opportunities. We have a professional photographer that donates his time and takes pictures of um, families. So it's that's one thing you don't even think of. These families can't even afford a family photo. Wow. So you don't think come it's in and take their family picture and print them off copies. And what a blessing to them you know, to have that memory. And um, it's been pretty neat because the photographer, Alberto, will take their picture and when he gives them to them, you'll see people tear up. But look at, I look pretty. They just needed somebody to capture that moment for them. And mm. it's pretty neat. 
Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. So if somebody would like to be involved and would like to help and work with you and serve the community, what's the best way for them to do that? I would go on our website, um, turnanewleaf.org, and there's a volunteer icon and go on it and you sign up and then um, our volunteer department will call them and respond to them right away and get that ball rolling, kind of see what pillar feels good to them or, you know, where they would fit in best, where their skills would be good. Um, some people volunteer on the weekends, some people volunteer during the day. We have so many options because we're big. Um, so we can always use the help and it's really pretty easy to get it going and get your questions answered. Mm, I love it. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap it up? Um, I think that's it. I just feel so lucky to share about our agency. Um, like I said, it's really my family. It's what I put in place in my life to kind of keep me stable and keep me feeling um, like my life has been fortunate and not to go into any kind of pity, like help others. And I think you get it. Not everybody gets it, but it's through giving that we receive. So, um, so true. You've been such a beautiful example of that. And I'm so blessed to know you and have gotten to know your organization um, over the past few years. Like I've said before, it's truly blessed our lives. And um, I'm so glad I know you and I'm so lucky to, to know you and everybody is who knows you. And I really appreciate um, you taking your time and effort and all of the things that you have done, but taking your time today to tell us about it and share your stories. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And you know how much we, I personally, and, and Joe and Michael, everybody loves you and John and what Birds Toyota does for a new leaf. We really love you guys. Well, we love you too. And for everybody listening, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening. God bless you and create today. And just remember, you want to create the life that you want. It's just do it one day at a time.